Gracie Jiu Jitsu rocks. Welcome to the Gracie Jiu Jitsu Rocks podcast, a podcast dedicated to Gracie Jiu Jitsu and all things Gracie, including self defense, competition, anti bullying, women's self defense and empowerment nutrition, and most especially, the people involved in Gracie Jiu-Jitsu. This podcast is for the average Joe. It's for anyone who practices, trains, teaches, or just loves to talk about or hear about Gracie Jiu-Jitsu. We'll explore the lives of Gracie Jiu-Jitsu practitioners, how they got involved in the art, and what effect it's had on their lives. So buckle up and enjoy the ride. Welcome to episode 106 of the Gracie Jiu-Jitsu Rocks podcast. As always, I'm your host, Marty Josie, and thanks for listening. Today my guest will be Jason Colbreth, Voice Gracie Black Belt and owner and head instructor at Cary Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu in Cary, North Carolina. And we'll get to that in just a moment, but before we do, let's do our quote. Jiu-Jitsu and martial arts do not build character, they reveal it. We are all born with unmeasurable courage and determination, but it is as we go through the trials of rigorous training that we rediscover those gifts. Ricardo Almeida. All right, on to the interview. Jason Colbert, as I stated, is a Hoist Gracie black belt and owner and head instructor of Cary Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu in Cary, North Carolina. He has over 25 years of martial arts experience, including wrestling, Taekwondo, Muay Thai, and Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. As an undefeated mixed martial arts fighter and active BJJ competitor, Jason has medaled in many local and international events, including winning the 2016 Masters Worlds. As one of the pioneers in MMA and BJJ, Jason has contributed to the growth of the sport since its infancy. He was an integral part of getting MMA legalized in the state of North Carolina and has coached many successful MMA and BJJ competitors. In this interview, we discuss a variety of topics, including competition, self-defense, nutrition, injuries, what it takes to stay in jiu-jitsu long-term, his new prestigious academy, and much more. So I know you're going to enjoy this interview. After the interview, make sure you stay tuned for the Make a Difference, Make an Impact segment. And now, without further ado, let's talk to Jason. All right, I'm speaking with Jason Colbreth, Hoist Gracie Black Belt and owner and head instructor of Cary Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu in Cary, North Carolina. So thanks for speaking with me today, Jason. Well, thank you so much for having me. Yeah, it's my pleasure. And I should mention that uh, you and your brother are a joint effort when running that school. Uh, let's talk about that school for a moment. You carry Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. It's a pretty recent uh, venture, right? You opened it pretty recently. So what led you to open that new school and how's it going so far with it? Uh, it's, it's going great. Um, you know, I just decided that it was time uh, in our area to have, you know, a professional jiu-jitsu academy. And um, people say, what do you mean professional jiu-jitsu academy? Well, e- everything is is top notch. Everything is first rate from you walking through the door, how we treat you when you get there, the culture on and off the mat inside the facility the type of mat that we have. We have an elevated floor uh, that uh, has like a gymnastics floor up underneath it. Uh, So it's very cushioned when you get thrown or you take downs or you get swept hard or something like that. Uh, So it's very safe. And, you know, the the way that we encourage people to learn or uh, progress, you know, is is through trying new stuff and not being afraid to try things. Mm. And so it's been a it's been a, a, a great great place the place is bright it's it's you know you can see very well it's not like a dark and and dungy place you know i'm constantly cleaning you know so it's always clean um 
smells fresh. Uh, it's new, but uh, my goal is to keep it that way. Yeah, it, I haven't seen it yet in person, but seeing it on you know through pictures on Facebook, it looks like a, just a beautiful, beautiful place. And I love the elevated floors, man. That makes such a difference over time, especially you know with taking a lot of falls and and takedowns and everything. It just, it, uh, I think that's a great thing to have. It really is because, you know, I've had so many of my students come to me since we've had this floor and say, you know, coach, thanks for putting in this floor. It really takes the fear of doing takedowns away, you know, because not only are you a lot of times you afraid to be taken down, but you're afraid to attempt a takedown because you might hurt your training partner. Right. And so, you know, I've got guys that are they're just going after each other uh, and and, uh, you know, they bounce and they get up and they're like, wow, this is awesome. You know, it's not a big bounce. It's not like a like you're going to get an extra two feet out of it, but it does cushion the blow significantly. It's almost like landing on a crash pad all the time, but that is firm. Mm -hmm. And then we do have a crash pad that we can throw on top of it. And then you could you could throw somebody as hard as you wanted to and they'd be fine. Nice. I, I really think that's a great thing to have for sure. So tell us a little more about your overall mission statement or philosophy of the school. You know, I guess our biggest philosophy is is help somebody else get better. And that's kind of, you know, we we look at it as a as a group approach to improvement. And so, you know, one of the things I say every night before we roll is you're responsible for your partner's safety. Your ego doesn't need to feel them tap to know that you have something. So just let it go before something bad happens and you lose a training partner. And, you know, that that's, you think, oh, you guys are taking it easy. You're being soft. I promise you my guys aren't soft. <laughs> I can guarantee <laughs> no, that. <believe> it. <laughs> but, but they're very courteous to one another and to other people. And, you know, what we try to do is, you know, I don't allow people to keep score in the academy. Like, oh, I tap him, I tap him, yeah. I tap him. If I hear that discussion, we shut that down right away. Um, because... I want you to go out there and feel like you can try a new move, it not work, you get tapped out, you smile, you slap hands, you go back, you try it again with the next guy, and you it might fail again. And I want you to have the comfort that you can fail trying a million times until you get this move mastered, and then you never fail with it. But if we're keeping score, I'm always going to revert back to my A game. That's right. And That's right. I'm not going to develop a B game. And if I'm in competition and somebody shuts down my A game, then I don't have a B game. Yeah. And I see this happen a lot of times. You know, maybe your A game is good enough to put you on the top of the mat. But uh, the likelihood of that happening is pretty slim. And how many people in your academy actually compete? You know, we have a fraction of our guys that compete. I want people to be able to come and have a good time and have fun, you know, have the camaraderie, get the great workout, you know, make lots of friends, sweat, use it as like their personal meditation. Uh, and and you're not going to get that when it's an antagonistic environment. Man, I really love that. I love that. And, and I've seen that uh, not only BJJ, but karate, a lot of other schools, if it, if it's not – a welcoming place if it's all about ego driven and in competition like you said you're always going to use your a game because you don't want to look bad or lose or whatever so you're never developing weak areas or or you know being vulnerable enough to try new things which i love how you encourage really love how you said help somebody get better or let somebody else get better it really speaks to you know I, you know i've said this many times culture comes from the top and setting that that place, you know, and I don't think for a minute you guys don't go hard, but at the same time, it's not all about just pushing it and, and beating each other. It's, it's welcoming. And whether you compete or not, that's really a big thing too. And, and, you know, I've been on the opposite end of the spectrum. I've been at that point where, you know, we beat each other to death. We antagonized each other to pieces. We talked so much junk. We were after each other. We were going hard, hard, hard. We loved it. Right. But the group that loved that was a very small group. And what you realize is that, yes, you're going to have, you know, the old Team Rock School, the original one. You know, we had 10, 12, 15 guys that were phenomenal, won everything. And the problem was you had only 10, 12 or 15 guys because nobody else could either take it, didn't like it, couldn't last. You know, and back then it was, you know, well, you're just not tough enough. Yeah. Well. The, the, what happens is, and I have a student that's a great example of this. He came to us. He's now lost over 60 pounds, 
And, um, you know, he had never done an athletic event in his life. And he came to jujitsu because he wanted to conquer some, some inner demons and some personal fears. And because of the way that we run the program and because of the way we're a curriculum driven system, he was able to learn the moves, understand the moves. He's a very analytical guy and, and he really wanted to understand the nuances of the moves. And now he's gone on and done extremely well uh, and had a, a great career in jujitsu and is having a great career in jujitsu from a guy who's never done anything athletic. And that's the guy whose life I've changed. Mm -hmm. And and that's the type of people that I want to you know, I want to have on my mat and I want to surround myself with because he's going to, he's always giving back to other people. You know, if somebody asks him a question, he spends the time with them. And that's just an amazing feeling every day when you go into the gym and yes. you know, it's, it's, a, it's incredible. And, I, and I've been on the other side and I, and it was a blast, but it, but we only had 15 or 20 people, not 60, 70, 80, 100, 150 people. Right. I mean, it, it limits you because uh, there's a certain amount of people like that that like that. But essentially, it's more of the fight club than, yep. you know, a real school that welcomes. You know, you either kind of have the notion or believe the notion jujitsu is for everybody or it's only for the roughest and toughest only. And if you really believe that it's for everybody, you certainly can have your smaller group that you guys want to, you know, push it be more intense uh, and you know who you can do that with but you also can have the overall school where everybody feels welcome and everybody doesn't have to be the toughest or, or the most intense to feel like they're really growing and learning and developing and that like you said that's how you impact so many more people in jiu-jitsu and that's a huge you know that's a huge thing that's that that's the you know really that's the differentiator between a school and a, what i would consider a real academy mm. as is really the environment that you create and when you create those types of environments i think the success just comes on top of that and the type of people that you surround yourself with on a daily basis man it just makes it just makes everything a breath of fresh air yeah well i love your philosophy it's really uh, really refreshing and i think it's very appropriate for this day and age and, and being really encompassing Let's talk a little bit about you. You had a, you recently had surgery, so tell us what led to that and then how things are going with that. Well, yeah, another surgery, right? Another surgery. Another surgery. I've had quite a few, and I went to my doctor this last time, and I said, "Hey, what? You know, what's going on? Why do I have all these problems? You know, is it you know my too tough on my body or whatever?" And he said, "Well, you kind of got the short end of the stick. You just have weak connective tissues, and so." Uh, that's nice to know, but he also said you may be tougher on your body than you know, and so you combine the two together between jujitsu and a hard head and uh, and weak ligaments, and you have some surgery. So uh, I had a partially torn bicep tendon, and I had a partially torn rotator cuff that I had scheduled for surgery, and we were taking it easy, trying not to tear either one of them fully to make it a simple surgery, a couple of stitches, let them heal up, get the inflammation out, go back to training. And uh, the Monday before my surgery, which was on Wednesday, I looked down in the shower and my bicep had tore completely off oh, in the middle man. of the night. Man. So I've had a bicep tear on my right arm and I've had a bicep tear now on my left arm. So I have matching scars and uh, – you know, but it's the, the, the it's well, going at good. At least you're I, symmetrical, right? <laughs> exactly. I tell my nephews, I said, well, what happens? My biceps were so big, the doctor's going to give me zippers to pull them back out. <laughs> nice, nice. Well, I've heard that's just excruciating. Is that true? I'm tearing uh, biceps? No, actually, no? the one that happened in the middle of the night, I had no idea. And the wow. first one that happened, it felt like a twing. And I looked down and I said, oh, wow. And, and what happened was when they went into my shoulder, into my bicep, he said, you know, you got the, the unlucky straw. You have a bone spur. And what that bone spur has been doing is just sawing on that bicep tendon. There's nothing could have changed it. He's like, there's nothing that you would have done different. Mm. That bone spur was going to grow. And at a given time, you're just going to lose your bicep. And that's what happened. Interesting. Interesting. And you've been trying really hard for rehab. How's that going? That's going well. Um, I, you know, my, my doctor was happy with my progress. My PT guy said, you know, start pushing it a little bit more. He said, you took it a little too easy during the first, you know, four weeks. Uh, so now I'm trying to really, you know, get my mobility where it needs to be so that we can get back to the strengthening of the shoulder. I won't be able to strengthen the bicep tendon much for another four weeks. And then, uh, and then it's on, and then hopefully it's mm -hmm. it's full go. So I'm trying to get 100% of my movement back by that point in time. 
Well, you know, I think that's smart because even if you went a little too light, I think if you got to air one way or another, that's the way to do it because there's so many, I've heard so many people who didn't baby it enough, so to speak, and, you know, tried to hold back a little bit, but invariably pushed it too hard and it just set them back over and over, you know, so, yep. so good for you for, for kind of keeping the reins on when you needed to. Well, you know, I've had, a, I've, like I said, I've had a lot and, uh, you know, what I've learned over all these surgeries is listen to your PTs and listen to your doctors. You know, they, they do know what they're doing. You know, it doesn't matter how much experience you have at it. They really know a whole lot more. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. It's true. They're the experts, yeah. right? That's why you're paying them, right? Exactly, exactly. All right, well, let's shift gears. I know you've been in the game, uh, jiu-jitsu, for many, many years. And let's talk about how you got started. Did you do any other arts before jiu-jitsu, or was it the first one? And how did you get going in jiu-jitsu? And, and uh, let's go from there. All right, well, that's a relatively long story. But, yeah, I did some martial arts when I was a kid. Uh, I did Taekwondo when I was young. And then... um I did that for I don't know how many years, but probably till I was 15 or so. And then during that time, I also wrestled uh, and I wrestled all the way up through my junior year of high school. And, uh, you know, that that was a blast. Wound up going to UNCW and, you know, did the college kid thing, got out of school, found a job, started working and really didn't have anything to compete in. So I said, well, you know, I'll start running. So I started running, trying to train. I wanted to run the New York City Marathon and my knee just couldn't take it. And the pain was just excruciating. I wound up having to have my first ACL surgery because I tore my ACL when I was 14 doing Taekwondo and I just didn't have it fixed till I was about 25. So I did that and I tried to swim, uh, but my shoulder wouldn't handle it. <laughs> so I was talking to a buddy of mine uh, down in Fayetteville, and we brought up jiu-jitsu because I'd heard about it from some friends of mine from Salisbury, uh, a guy named Kevin Honeycutt and Mike Schuler, And they were, I guess, training and had trained some with Hickson back then. And so I was mentioning it to my buddy down there. He said, well, I have some friends on base that teach it. Why don't we go to a class? And so I went to my first class, and it was a great – they had the old mats that Velcro together, mm-hmm. and I wound up breaking my big toe. <laughs> the, you know, you tape them together and you keep going, right? Keep going. <laughs> so it's just a toe. And uh, so anyway, so I, I did the class. I was blown away by it, loved it. And uh, I was talking to my buddies and I said, well, we should get these videotapes and start training. And he said, well, why would you, why do you want to get that? Greg Thompson and Anderson Dickey teach right next door to where his business was. And I'd grown up with Greg. Uh, we'd gone to the pool together and taken Taekwondo together. So I'd known him pretty much, you know, since I was a little kid. And the Anderson was funny because I used to babysit him when he was a little kid. Really? Yeah. Interesting. <laughs> so I go over there and uh, started training with those guys. And, you know, that room was stacked with studs. I mean, they were all incredibly strong. They were all weightlifters. And, you know, I was the weakest guy in the room by far. And, you know, I just took my beatings and I was the first guy there every single day. And I was the last guy to leave every single day. And, you know, they just, they tortured me. But uh, slowly, one by one, something would happen and they would take time off and I would make progress on them. And if they took a little bit more time off, you know, I just kind of climbed up the hill uh, and next thing you know, it's, you know, me and Greg and, and, and everybody else. Wow. Perseverance really pays off, right? Oh, uh, it does. And I tell people, you know, to, to get good, you have to put in the time and you have to be willing to rep things over and over and over again. Yeah. I bet it was a really interesting time back then. Cause then North Carolina is, is huge now with jujitsu, but, uh, you were one of the ones early on with that whole kind of grassroots movement that and you've seen it spread you know throughout the state and and over the years so tell us a little more about what it was like in those early days there it was brutal (laughs) in a word brutal (laughs) it was brutal um because again like i said you know probably i would probably say the average bench in that room at the time was probably 340 maybe 360 somewhere in that range had a bunch of guys, you know, benching in the high threes, bunch of guys benching over four, you know, my little scrawny butt was benching about 210 and, (laughs) you know, and I didn't know anything and we didn't know anything as a group. You know, we were watching the videos and we had bootlegged a lot of the videos from putting a, you know, video camera in front of a, a big screen and filming it so we could all study it 
you know, and so you'd watch video and you'd go to the mat and try to execute what you were watching or you'd watch video to come teach class. And, you know, we did, I mean, everything was legal, right? So, you know, guillotines were legal, all the leg locks were legal. Everything was full blown because we were doing it, you know, preparing for fights like, like it was a martial art. Right. Uh, it wasn't at all the sport aspect. You know, if we did a jiu-jitsu tournament, it's like, oh, we'll just go do this little jiu-jitsu tournament. And then we were early, early, early in the MMA scene here in North Carolina. And so, you know, we wound up just, oh, well, you should go fight, you know. And, and back then, you know, you had you constantly had people come by the school and they wanted to jump in and, and they wanted to roll. And then during the roll, invariably at some point in time, they would tell you, that, well, well, I could punch you. No, and so uh, that's fair. I'll let you do that. But just remember one thing. Every time you swing at me, I'm going to hit you twice. And, you know, the, they would be like, what? I said, well, yeah, but I can punch too. <laughs> exactly. And they seem to think like they were the only ones that could punch. So, you know, we had groups of guys that would come in. Like we wound up with a, a bunch of guys coming and joining our school that came in from Burlington. They were training with these two brothers who were semi-pro football players and were massive and super strong. And they came, they all came down to roll one night. And I was like, again, I was, I was small. I was new, you know, I wasn't near the best at our academy and they made me roll with one of their instructors from the other school and I wound up arm barring him and then uh so I sat down I, real quick you know because I told my coach I don't want to do this he's like go ahead Jay you'll be fine and I was like oh my god this guy's gonna murder me and arm barred him and then so we we sat back down and he wanted to go again so we went again I triangled him and then so he ripped off his gi and he's like He's like, I just can't stand this gi. I, I'm used to going no gi. You want to go no gi? And I said, no, I'll keep my gi on if you don't mind. And I armbarred him again. <laughs> so, so I, you know, I was like, oh, maybe this stuff does work. You know, maybe my coaches are pretty good, you know. And so that was, you know, that's the kind of, the. I mean, it was like that all the time. We had people coming in from out of town all the time. They would hear about us and, and want to come in and test the waters. And it didn't go well for really any of them. Wow. That's very cool. Lots of great stories. I'm sure we're just touching on the tip of the iceberg. But uh. Yeah, I mean, it just, they happen for days, you know, and just all the traveling we did for MMA fights and having to go to Kentucky and all the stuff that went on in Virginia. It was, a, it was definitely a different time period. You know, it's like the Wild West of, of, of fighting or MMA and jiu-jitsu. So you really had to be dedicated in that instruction wasn't you know, everywhere. So you had to piece together what you could through VHS tapes and, and footage and bootleg copies of stuff and then just getting on the mat and, and going for it. Right. And just developing yeah, as you can. Exactly. And, we, you know, we would try to find a seminar, you know, and we would go to a seminar where you drive, you know, three to five hours and, and find somebody that was, you know, a purple belt, and, you know, that was teaching somewhere. And that was amazing. Like, oh, my God, it's a purple belt, you know, and there weren't very many of them. And then I remember when Margarita was up in Virginia, you know, we, we saw him compete when he was a purple belt. And we were just like, oh, my God, that guy's incredible. And of course, he, he wound up being incredible as a black belt, too. But you know, we saw him as he was coming up, uh, you know, we go to hoist this stuff. He would go to Richmond and have these huge seminars with hundreds of people there. And then he would come to Hillsborough and work with us. And then we started, you know, getting in with Ricardo Almeida and, and Flavio Almeida and learning from those guys and Matt Sarah and, you know, it, just a who's who. And we just went to everywhere we could go. You know, for me personally, I was driving about 40 minutes to class you know, every single day, you know, wow. people tell me, Oh, it's a long drive. You know, I was like, well, how far is it? They're like, Oh, it's 20 minutes. I'm like, man, I went 40 to 40 minutes to an hour, yeah. depending on where I was living at the time. And it was just something we did. You know, if it was a chance to drive to Charlotte to train with somebody, we'd drive to Charlotte to train with somebody. That's really cool. I mean, what a great time that was. I mean, easier these days to, you know, really be involved and develop through jujitsu, but there's something kind of really cool about those old times when you really wanted it bad enough you had to drive you're willing to, to go anywhere do anything to to get that knowledge and keep developing yeah because if you didn't you didn't have it you know you would get you know mario sperry's tapes and then yeah, uh, you know the hoist gracie basics and and uh then um i think craig kukok and them came out with the oh, jiu-jitsu yeah. uh and lowell anderson brazilian jiu-jitsu a to z which is actually a phenomenal uh you know set of material and then, you know, everybody would, you know, Eric Polson, I think at that time started coming out with a little bit of stuff. Uh, Chris Brennan came out with some stuff. Uh, you know, it was a, 
I mean, we were at the beginning when everybody was first putting out tapes, but they were putting out sets of tapes for, you know, two and three hundred dollars. So it was a little bit uh, yeah, pricey. I, I remember that. I did my first seminars with, with Hickson in 96 and, and you know, started getting the bug after watching the UFCs, the original UFCs. But I remember even back then you mentioned there weren't a lot of purple belts. I remember in Hickson's organization, if you were a blue belt, you were like, wow, you know, when I first got exposed. Now I have, I didn't stay steady for all those years. Unfortunately, I had to drop out for a while, but then came back. But um, I remember way back in the early 90s and mid 90s, how different it was. But what's the biggest change that you have seen over the years in jiu-jitsu? You know, it's, it's, I guess I've seen the swing in a lot of it. I've seen the swing from a martial art or the martial art format to, or fighting format to a sport format, you know, and then there's always the self-defense debate and we, we combat that with the way our curriculum works. But because I do believe in, that people need to learn a martial art to defend themselves, but I also believe that people need to go have a good time. Mm-hmm. And they want to go to class every night. And they want to have fun and doing all the crazy stuff is fun. Uh, you know, it's not it's not what I would use in a fight, but it's still fun to do, you know. Absolutely. Uh, so so I, I enjoy doing that. So I've seen that whole swing. I've seen it go from you couldn't find any information to you can find the most ridiculous information out there now. You know, everybody has got a YouTube channel, mm-hmm. throw some junk out there. And, and I tell my guys all the time, be careful, go watch people. Uh, you know, who have who have done something and then watch what you see them do in competition, because that's what they're they're doing. Doesn't mean that what the other stuff they're teaching is not great. But, you know, if somebody never, ever, ever goes for a Kimura and you've never seen him do it and yet he's got 10 DVDs out on a Kimura, not I don't know if that's the best DVD to watch, you know, mm-hmm. but if you go watch. You see the guy who's sweeping everybody or the guy who's passing everybody's guard, then you want to go study that guy because this is what he is doing. Mm-hmm. And 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 now, you know, back then there were lots of secrets in jiu-jitsu. Today, it, there are no secrets in jiu-jitsu. Uh, the minute somebody, you know, comes up with a, a slight variation on a technique, uh, it, it's a matter of, you know, days if not hours before Very it true. propagates. Very true. Yeah, it becomes the newest thing and it sweeps through the internet. And and then it goes underneath the rug and, it, you know, and every, everything makes cycles in jujitsu. You know, like right now, I always tell my guys, you know, the leg lock stuff is a cycle uh, because what will happen is the people doing them will get hurt. The people that have been having them done to them will get hurt. Academies will look at it and go, oh, these guys are hurt. And, you know, I've been saying this forever. And then lo and behold, what's Gordon Ryan do? Tears his knee up this past weekend, right? Mm-hmm. So, you know, Eddie Bravo with the rubber guard, that stuff's amazing. He's incredible with it. You have to be super flexible to play his game. How many times has he blown his knees out playing this rubber guard? So, you know, you have to decide, you know, I'm an old guy. So you have to decide how long do you want to do jiu-jitsu and at what level? No, that is a very good and important insight there and and comment because it's real easy to be attracted to shiny objects right and the newest little candy out there because wow that's the best but a bigger picture you know what's the cost like you said uh, especially for us that are getting older and want to stay in this for all our lives you know maybe rubber guard or maybe some of these other fancy uh, acrobatic things aren't for you so they're, they're fun to watch and, and no one says you shouldn't learn them but you got to make that decision how, how important is this and how much time I'm, am i really going to devote to doing this you know do i need that's to? right and you have to learn you know it, 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 i mean the whole the idea is that, and I tell my guys this all the time, there's no way I'm going to be the fastest guy in my school. I have guys that, that are so much faster than I am, but what I do is I make them slow. And so if I can make that guy slow, then I can appear fast Mm. and you have to learn the systems or the techniques that allow you to slow them down where I could keep up. Because if, if we're going to pay a play a, a full pace game, like when I'm playing with Dave Camarillo or something, I can't keep up, man. That guy is way, way, way too fast. And, and, and so, you know, you've got to figure out a way to slow him down. I haven't figured out how to slow him down yet, but I have a baseball bat. I think that'll do the trick. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good start, right? 
I like how you said that because it's it's good to to know and or be reminded of because as you do get a little older and I was going to ask if you had any advice for you know older practitioners who want to stay active and and, uh, kind of relevant and that's some good advice right there for older people that you're never going to be you're not going to match the athletic prowess or speed or some of these other attributes of younger more athletic people so it's a good thing to, to not try to do that, not try to match it, but slow them down. I like that a lot. And, and the other thing is that, you know, when you're, when you're older, you have to choose your rolling partners. Choose your training partners. I, do, I don't necessarily, you know, I did back, and I've done it my whole career, roll with these monstrous guys, you know. I don't do that anymore. I, I, I've done it. I've, I've done enough. I got plenty of guys in the room that want to go roll with that monster guy who are young, and they can go have them. But I'm not getting out there and getting bent up like a pretzel and having to deal with you know, it's not that I can't. I can do it once. Like they like the song says, I'm I'm as good once as I ever was. <laughs> but the problem is I want to stay on the mat the rest of the night. I don't yeah. want to have that match be tore up, beat up, sore, miserable the next day, can't get out of bed. That's just not my idea of fun anymore. Uh, you I know? completely agree. I mean just because you can doesn't mean you should, right? That's right. And then when you when you're older, focus on becoming a technician, understanding the nuances of the moves that make the moves effective. I'm teaching a, a guard pass right now that uh, I've tried many, many times and I've used it throughout the years with uh, relative success, but I didn't understand it exactly the way I should. And so I was going back and I knew I was going to be teaching this move and I went and did a bunch of research on the move again, just to freshen up, you know, anything that I may have forgotten or a detail or just to hear it from a different person. And I realized the difference in my balance of a couple of inches is a, you know, whether the move is 50% successful or 90% successful. Mm-hmm. And 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 so nerding out on those little nuances and the little details are what make things work. Otherwise, you go home and you say, oh, I can't do that. It doesn't work. Most of the time, the moves work. You either applied it at the wrong time mm-hmm. or you didn't apply it correctly. Right. right. And, and, and if you're older, enjoy becoming like the class, you know, um, encyclopedia. And know, uh, you know, all a lot of the moves and all the little nuanced details of the moves. And then, again, pick your training partners properly. Yeah, I, I really like that because, again, it depends on how much you let ego lead you or not. And uh, I think, you know, just not even on the mat and in jiu-jitsu, but in life, the, the, the more we can get away from being ego-led, the better. But as it applies on the mat, you know, as you get older, yeah, you can get caught up in that and say, I'm still I'm going to prove I can still hang with the, the young bucks. And you may be able to do it, but then what cost? At what cost, right? I don't want to get injured because being injured sucks and it keeps you off the mat for a long time. So I agree with you. You've got to be smarter as you get older and, and choose, uh, choose wisely. Yep. And, and it makes a big difference and, and it allows you to enjoy it. You know, I want to be doing this like Elia was into my 90s. Yeah, me too. Me too. You know, I don't want to go home with my neck completely cranked up. (laughs) Yeah, for sure. So that was great advice for us getting older. What about for people just starting out first, you know, first day or very early into it, newbies? What's some advice for them? Relax. You know, the, the, we we do a curriculum system. So I have um, a list of moves that are part of a curriculum and you, and you start in the beginning and we work our way through this list, uh, in the way we teach it. And then, you know, we, we test and then we go back and we, we do it again and we test and we go back and we do it again. We test, and we go back and we do it again. We test. And the way it works is you get your blue belt when you can do a hundred percent of the moves. And so I can say the move and you know what I'm doing. That works amazingly well because it allows a student who has a blue belt to be asked a question by a white belt about what is this move? They should know the answer to, you know, here's the basics of the move. I'm not expecting them to know the ins and outs and every little detail of the move, but they can explain the fundamentals of the move to the new person. So, you know, when you, when you, when somebody's starting out, I tell them, listen to your classmates, listen to your coach, practice what you're learning in class every day. If the teacher thinks it's important enough to teach, then you need to attempt that move or drill that move so many times till you can't get it wrong. Mm -hmm. And, 
you, you know, everybody's like, well, hey, Jay, coach, I've, I've done this and, and it doesn't work. OK, well, you've done it three times. Let's continue. Keep keep trying it, you know, and let me know when you get to 20 times. And now we'll talk about the flaw that you're having. And then if they've been doing it long enough and they can, you know, and they're rolling and stuff with people, try it over and over again when you're rolling. And then when you come to me, you can demo the problem and I can fix it. But if you just tell me it doesn't work and, and I said, well, how many times have you tried it? Well, I, I don't do it just because it doesn't work. Like, oh, <laughs> I, I, I can't fix that, man. You have right. to give it a shot. You have to try the moves. That's good. I like that. I like that. Uh, what about advice for someone interested in competition? And, and But they mainly do jiu-jitsu as a hobby. I mean, they're not by any means on the mat six, seven days a week, and they're not trying to be the, the pro champ, you know pro world champ so someone who's generally a hobbyist but they and they love self-defense but they also want to give competition a chance and you and you won believe it in 2016 was it the uh, world master championship that's correct that's correct so congrats on that by the way thank you thank you yeah i've been injured ever since but uh (laughs) but But they can't take it away from you right (laughs) that's right they can't take it away and i'm ready to 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 get healthy so i can try again um you know if like there are so many benefits to competition uh, outside of winning and losing. And I tell my guys, you know, I don't care if you win or lose, I'm going to be excited for you to go out there and challenge yourself because for, you know, it really depends on the individual for a lot of people, just going to the competition is an enormous win for them. It, it, they had to overcome a ton of internal demons to do that get them out of their comfort zone, go in front of a room full of screaming people. You know, you don't understand what's going on. The place is chaotic, right? Uh, People are complaining about calls and this and that. And the guy across the way just got his arm, you know, popped really bad. And the other guy over there got his ankle popped and people are limping around with ice on it. You're like, oh my God, why am I doing this? Right. And, 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 yeah, there is an error that those things could happen to you. But I tell guys, look, just if you're in a bad situation, just tap. You don't have to wait till the guy pops your arm to prove anything. You got caught in an arm bar. The mistake was you got in the arm bar. Right. You know, let's tap early. Let's go train another day. And let's not let, like we talked about earlier, not let our egos write checks with our bodies. And, you know, so, so there's that win to competing is just the internal demons. And then if you want to get better at competition, compete as often as you can. And then when you do compete, stick around and watch. So many people go out there, they do their match, they win, they lose, whatever. Their matches are over, they pack up, they go home. I tell all of my students, if you spend a day, if you just went to the worlds and you watch from the first day through the last day, all the belts, as long as you could, your butt could stand sitting in that seat, and I've done it the full time, you will come back better. You'll see how the best guys in the world move. You'll see what they're doing. You'll see how they carry themselves. You'll see, you know, if you if you really pay attention, how they're problem solving in a match or the strategy they're playing in a match. Because a jiu-jitsu match is just a game. And that's all we're doing. We're playing within a fixed set of rules that you've agreed to when you walk out on that mat. And, you know, it, it, hey, if you can game the system, then you game the system. Okay, cool. Do you give any uh, general or specific advice for your students when they're competing? Do you do you advocate always like going for a takedown or just kind of defending and capitalizing on defending or anything like that? Well, I, I like I like for people to score early. It, it makes it changes the dynamics of the match. You know, if you're up in points or advantages or whatever, uh, the other person has to work to catch up, and that gives you opportunities to continue to score more. Um, in the worlds back in 16, when I did win my second match, you know, I scored early. I got the takedown, I wound up in the guy's half guard and, you know, that guy was going crazy trying to, trying to win. And I wound up passing his guard. The first time I passed, I tore my ribs. And so I was just trying to hang on. You know, I had five points. It's like, man, I'm going to hang on. Well, there's four minutes and something to go. <laughs> it's a long time to hang <laughs> on to a guy. <laughs> and that guy really wanted to win. And uh, so he kept, you know, squirming and putting me back in half guard and trying and trying and trying. And I kept passing and passing and passing. And I think I beat him 18 or 19 to nothing. Wow. But he had to work because he was down from the get-go. Yeah. 
and he wasn't just willing to concede the match. Oh, I'm down by five points. I'm done. He fought, man. I, I give that guy all the credit. If I'd have made a mistake, he was all he was going to be all over me. And so that, you know, you've, you've got to, you know, have this forethought about competition. So you go out, you, you, you've got to have your A game. You should be able to say, what is my move from each of these positions? What's my best move from each of these positions? And then you have to build a strategy and develop your own game around what you believe or you and your coach believe are your best positions and, and get to your game first. You know, you've seen a lot of people who have a tremendous, you know, people think for years they thought, you know, Guy and Hoffa were just guard players, right? And they, oh, all they do is pull guard and then they, they bear and ball. Well, yeah, because nobody was stopping their bear and bowls. Right. <laughs> so, so w- why not pull guard? And then people say, well, I'll pull guard. My guard's better. So I'll pull guard. And then they pull guard on Hoffa and Guy. But Hoffa and Guy are incredible guard passers. And so then they were passing everybody's guard. And, and now the people have a real, real problem. And what they were doing is pulling guard with other people and then popping up and getting the advantage. And now the person on bottom has to really go to town. Mm. And, and, and those guys, if you want to watch a strategy play out, watch those guys. You know, not only do they finish a lot, but they have a, a great strategy. And then you have, you know, of course, we have Lucas up in Charlotte who's just, you know, on another planet. And, and and watch how they address the game. You know, I watched the guy compete against Lucas one time and, and everybody's like, oh, my God, he almost beat Lucas. You know, Lucas only beat him by two points. And I thought, you know, it's the first match of the night. That's the only amount of points Lucas needed to win. by. Exactly. Exactly. Why, why and, do you need to rack up a bunch of extra points? Right. Right. Why wear yourself out? Right. Why have this battle that's unnecessary? Now, I know Lucas and Lucas always wants to finish. So I know that's going to be his goal. But he wants to win another Worlds more than he wants to get that finish in the first round if it seems like it's going to take too much out of him. Mm-hmm. And, and that's a strategy. And, and so when new people are going out there competing, they've got to come up with what they believe is their strategy and then make people have a jiu-jitsu game with, for you. Right? If, if you're just pushing each other around on the mat, playing you know, the bull in the china shop game, uh, not really trying to take down, but kind of trying to take down. And then next thing you know, four minutes and, <laughs> you right. know, 30 seconds or 40 seconds has gone by. And then the guy pulls it, pulls guard and you touch your hip to the floor and he gets an advantage. It's like, man, you didn't have a jiu-jitsu match. You had a, a terrible wrestling match to which you lost. Right. And, and, and so in that, in that regards, I think people looking down on people for pulling guard, you know, uh, you might want to consider what's the, What's the overall goal? Maybe I don't have great wrestling. Maybe I should be getting better at my wrestling. But at this point in my career, when I'm doing this, I don't have wrestling. So I'm going to go make a jiu-jitsu match where I think I can succeed. And that's going to be maybe pulling guard. Okay. Good stuff. Let's shift over to self-defense now. I'm assuming that with your background that self-defense forms the foundation of what you teach and everything. So what what are some of the most important things to consider in self-defense? I love self-defense. It is to me, it's a blast. It's as much fun as getting on the mat and rolling. And again, you can nerd out on the details. The mistake that people make a lot of times is they say, uh, you, I would just punch him in the face. So well, that's cool. You would, but what are you going to tell your 12 year old daughter? Mm-hmm. What are you going to tell your, you know, your undersized son that can't punch somebody in the face or punching them in the face might not be the best thing. Right. So you have to learn the self-defense or what are you going to do when you're 70 and you can't and you can't move very well because you spent too many years doing jujitsu mm-hmm. and somebody comes up to hold you up at a at an ATM machine. So now, oh, I'll, I'll double like, no, you're 70 years old. You're not double legging anybody. And if your knee touches the concrete, you're going to shatter your knee. So you might need to have another way to look after yourself. Oh, I have a, I have a gun. I always hear this all the time. I have a gun. And I always ask people when they tell me that, where's your gun? What's in the car? (laughs) 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 That gun is useless. You need to have a weapon in yourself and you need to be able to, you know, with self-defense, when you reach into the toolbox and you pull out the tool, it has to be the right one. You don't get a second chance. Mm -hmm. And it's the first reaction that happens that makes the biggest difference in the self-defense situation. And, you know, and I really try to, to, 
pound this into my guys heads is that you know it's it's great to do the jiu-jitsu the sport aspect but the first thing comes self-defense self-preservation defending yourself teaching your family members your wife your kids to defend themselves that's where true confidence comes in when you know you can protect yourself or protect your loved ones in in you know a situation when it arises and that doesn't mean just now when you're young and you're a stud but when you're old and you're beat up and you you've had a you had a tough go you still need to be able to take care of all those people that you care about well said well said so are there any things you feel like get really missed or overlooked in self defense or you know not emphasized enough you know uh, in Gracie Jiu-Jitsu, it is a complete martial arts, and we do have some striking, and I watch a lot of the self-defense stuff, and, and nobody – well, I say nobody, but I do know a lot of guys that do teach some of the striking in with the self-defense. So there, there's various aspects of self-defense because a self-defense situation could turn into a fight, mm-hmm. right, very quickly. So you have to understand that. I don't think that everybody puts enough time into understanding how to get to a clinch how to control the person to the ground, how to maintain position, uh, and then look, you know, these are, it's like a stages of, of what you're doing. But if you say, what's the one thing people neglect? I don't think they work enough on the clinch stuff. Mm-hmm. I, I think they want to work on the grip breaks. They want to work on the, you know, the headlock escapes, which are all important things. They want to work on choke defense. They want to work on being pushed. You know, all these things are awesome things, but as grapplers, we need to be able to close the distance effectively, maintain, you know, some stability in that position, and then take direct the fight or the situation to a place where I can, you know, make the other guy look good almost, you know, because that's how you stop something from escalating out of hand. If, if, I, if we get in a, a confrontation and I punch you or slap you, you don't have a choice. We're going to have to have a fight. Right. But if you grab me and I just clear my hand out of the way and say, come on, man, calm down. Now you don't have to fight me. You're like, oh, I, yeah, he knows something. And you just kind of move off to the side. So you let him know that you are a threat, but you also let him save face. So yep. it didn't have to escalate. And I think that I agree with that. Two two areas I think that could be emphasized more are not only like you said the clinch but dealing with punches at all in all aspects uh when they're trying to when you're trying to clinch or when you're trying to go for a headlock escape and they start punching you or various other things you know adding punches to other scenarios or when you're basically just kind of you know rolling throwing some punches in there things like that so it's not one or the other you're over here doing self-defense or you're doing rolling sometimes merging the two are some of the best things you can do but so mainly adding punches throughout i think is a good thing but also long before it gets to a physical altercation i think we can emphasize a lot more is the situational awareness getting out of danger before you get too much into it and then verbally de-escalating and and not letting your ego get the best of you like you know what let them save face and just kind of walk away if you can i mean what's what's it's not worth it it's not worth it. And, and, you know, the way the, the way the courts are today and, you know, the, 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 the people that are in the juries are, you could do, you could completely do self-defense and wind up seeing yourself in prison. Like my buddy, Matt Coakley did, hmm. right. He's doing eight years and the jury agreed it was self-defense. Wow. Now that's crazy. That is crazy. Like, like why would you agree that it's self-defense, but yet you convict the guy and then he gets eight years. That's that's a lot. <laughs> yeah, that's a lot. That's a lot, and and that's a lot for defending yourself. Um, and so you know you have to be careful, like you said. That I mean, the very first stage is is what did this person do that's so bad that you want to fight? Like I'm not. Did they did they push you? Did they shove you? Did they hit you? Did they grab your wife or your child? No. Well, then I don't need to fight you. We, we need to have – we might have a conversation. Maybe I'm not comfortable with what you said or what you did or what your actions or where the direction you're heading, but I don't need to escalate it into a fight where I need to prove myself because that's a no-win situation. Mm-hmm. I, you know, understanding that – just walk away. 
And and I know people say, oh, that's easier said than done. I know. I've been in a lot of fights. <laughs> right. it's, I've, I've not been a nice person my whole life. Um, but as I learned more about fighting, the less I wanted to fight because I realized there are some really good people out there in the world that are incredible fighters. And they don't necessarily look like fighters. And I don't want to run into that guy who's an incredible fighter and get embarrassed in front of all my friends. Right. Exactly. <laughs> like Jason, I thought you were a black belt. I am, but that guy's really good. <laughs> you know? Or you slip on something and you hit your head right, or you right. slip on something and you wind up on the ground or he has a friend who sucker punches you from behind. Okay. And so just exactly what you said is, is learning to deescalate, learning to be, you know, situational awareness. No, you know, way ahead of time when things are getting ready to take to the next yes, level. Yeah. And it's usually something you say or they say that provokes you to go further. And you know, I try to tell people all the time, it's just words, man. It's not physical violence. If they come at me physically and I've controlled the distance and I can kind of control their reactions, I, I stand a chance to deescalate this still. But if it is going to come into a situation, I need to be able to, again, close that distance, avoid the punches, mm -hmm. because if you get if you get knocked out, it doesn't matter what happens yeah, after that. Over, right? Right? It's, a, it's a done deal. And if you wind up slipping and they're on top of you, uh, you need to be able to protect yourself if you do get back to guard or how to stand back up. Yeah, that's you know? a big one. So when you said it's just words, it reminds me of uh, Patrick Swayze in R Roadhouse. He, he made a, a similar comment, you know, something like it's just two syllables strung together to elicit a response or something like that. But, yeah, it's just words. If you don't allow them to have the meaning and get you all triggered or whatever, you know, it's, it's, it's all good. You know, another thing is there's such a fine line with self-defense because if someone is attacking you and you defend yourself, but then you get control and you're mounted or whatever it may be and you continue to pulverize the guy, it ceased being self-defense. But you're in the, heat of the moment beating the crap out of him and now they're going to charge you. So, yeah. And that looks really, really bad on everybody's cell phone. <laughs> yes, it does. Right. It's and all on tape now, man. It's all on tape. Everywhere you go, it's tape. Yeah. You know, just assume that there's a camera everywhere you are. And so can you explain this away to a, a jury that has no ex – that a, a, a group of 12 people, not one of which has ever been in a fight and been punched in the face? And now you're trying to explain why you did what you did. They, they've never had that experience. They've never had that feeling. They've never had that aggressive attitude. Right. And so they're going to think, man, you're just a terrible, horrible person. And, and that's not a good thing. <laughs> you're right, especially as society seems to be going more and more to, you know, all violence is bad. Right. You know, period. Instead of, like you said, we live in a different world. We know the nature of violence and sometimes it's needed and, and you know, that kind of thing. But not everybody's been exposed to that world. Exactly. And they and they don't want to or they want, you know, they know that world exists, but they want to put their head in the sand and say it doesn't exist around me. Sure. And, and 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 you can live in that little um, created world yourself and, and that's fine and hide from it. And hopefully nothing bad ever comes your way. But I don't I don't suspect that I'm always going to be prepared. And if nothing, you know, you buy life insurance or you buy health insurance, you hope you never have to have a sur surgery. But I can tell you, my health insurance has been money well spent. Mm -hmm. For sure. All right. Let's shift a little bit because I want to get a couple more things in before we are out of time. Besides getting surgeries, do you have any other hobbies off the mat? <laughs> and also, <laughs> also, let's talk about uh, your nutrition uh, regimen and why that's so important to you as well. Sure. Uh, so yeah, off the mat, I, I like to do, I mean, I like to do all kinds of crazy stuff. Uh, you know, I enjoy, uh, wake surfing. I used to wake board a lot, but my body just, you, you know, you get out there and you get to flying through the air and then you want to try flips and things like that. And it doesn't, doesn't go so well when you're an old guy. So I gave that up for mostly wake surfing. Uh, and that way I can do it and, and I can have a great time at it and try new tricks and challenge myself and not get hurt. Uh, I like to go kite surfing, uh, I'm not great at it, but I've been starting to pick it up over the last few years with some friends uh, that we travel and we go at the Outer Banks and stuff. That's a lot of fun, um, and I try not to do stupid stuff on that either. I love anything with the water. I like the backpacking. I don't get to go as often as I would like because I spend a lot of my 
uh, extra time going to tournaments and traveling to events with students. So I don't get to do as much backpacking as I would like, but I do really enjoy getting out there and, and you know, sweating in the woods and, and uh, just and just de-stressing everything. No cell phones, no nothing. Just enjoy it, you know. Right and plugging, so th- right? Yeah, exactly. And, and then, you know, uh, as far as nutrition goes, uh, I've been studying nutrition for a, a large majority of my life, um, and, and I've, I've done all kinds of things. Uh, and tried every every diet out there because it, it's hard to say, you know, you can't really make an honest assessment of something if you haven't tried it. And you're like me. You've come up through the years where everything was, you know, you've done the low fat diets, right? Everything yes. cut the fat, cut the fat, cut the fat, yes. you know, and then you and then, you know, then Dr. Atkins, everybody was was poo pooing on his diet. And and he talked about the health benefits of, of you know, being in ketosis and, and, and cutting out the carbs and increasing the fat. And, you know, his diet is really a modified ketogenic diet. And that's what more people do that do keto is they'll do it more like he did, more modified, a little bit higher protein. But and then, you know, now you've had the the, the overwhelming amount of research on the other benefits of being in ketosis and of, of having you know, nutritionally induced ketosis, um, where, you know, some of the Alzheimer's stuff, uh, the early onset dementia, of course, dropping your weight, you know, that's a, that's a big part of it, but there's a lot of, you know, mental clarity that goes along with not having the sugar increases and the fogginess and all that kind of stuff. And sort of like jujitsu, I tell people when you're dieting, it needs to be, you know, what's your goal? You know, you have to be honest about your why. And once you know what you're, why, why are you doing this? And it's not, well, I need to lose 10 pounds. Well, why? Well, I just want to lose 10 pounds. But you want to lose 10 pounds for a reason. Is it for an event? Is that, you know, do you need, I, I'll teach you how to cut 10 pounds. That, that, we can do that in two days, right? right I can right. probably do that in the next two hours. Um, but, you know, is it is it to improve your health and longevity? And that's what I look at everything now. As an old guy, I'm not going to be, a, you know, a bodybuilder. I'm never going to get huge. And so I'm trying to do things or, or treat my body so that I can have a long life uh, and a long productive, active life, not, you know, have to deal with all the medical conditions that come with, you know, overeating or eating too much of the wrong stuff. Yeah, You know, it's really standard in, in our society if you're in your whatever 60s or 70s or beyond that you have – seven, eight, nine, 10, 12 pill bottles, you know, on your, on your cabinet or whatever. And that's just, uh, you're on everything. And some, some of them are to deal with some of the um, conditions that the others cause, you know, the side effects. So it's, it's maddening. But if we really get back to, it's all about nutrition. Most of it starts with nutrition. Most, most diseases and not all, but most either are caused by your body being out of balance and, and nutrition wise. And um, and your gut health, or at least are influenced by it. So I think if we get back to really making that the foundation, you can impact so much. And you know, I, I remember way back when it was like, because I used to be, I was trained as a, a fitness trainer years ago, and you know, we went from eating three squares a day, but when you had three squares a day, you you'd stop at five or six, and you had a good twelve hours or so as a fast. Mm-hmm. Right? And breakfast was break fast, and and your body does a lot during that fasting state. And then it went to the wisdom of food pyramid, but also the and tons of you know carbs, but also eat every couple of hours to keep your blood sugar regulated, and and all that stuff now is, is just shown that it affects the hormones in the way we don't want to affect them, and, and the more information that's coming out, it's all about the hormonal effect on the body. You know, it's not about calories or whatever. So yeah, I, I'm learning more about that every day, and I'm reading a lot more about fasting. I do intermittent fasting, but just fasting in general, I think, is a really interesting subject. That when you mention that word in our society, people are like, "What fasting? How could you go without eating?" But you look in throughout history, every society has had some form of fasting times when they fasted, uh, maybe for religious reasons or health reasons or whatever. But anyway, it's just really interesting to to dive into that a little bit. 
It's funny that you mention that because I tell people that all the time. They say, well, look at the, you know, look at the Mediterranean diets and look at this diet and look at these people. And these people live to be so old. I said, yeah, but look at what their primary religion is and look how often they wind up actually fasting from right. sun up to sundown or, or, you know, have a full fast for a couple of days. You know, there's – and then a lot of these people don't have an abundance of food that they're eating constantly or they stay too busy to eat on the regular basis. Um, you know, fasting is incredibly healthy. W what we do is we become so carb addicted that we're always pumping up our blood sugar levels. And then when those blood sugar levels drop, that's when everybody's like, oh, I have to eat. I have to eat. No, what it is is your body's a crack addict and it's saying, <laughs> give exactly. me more, exactly. you know, and, and you're not strong enough to stop that. And I understand how hard it is. I've spent I spent a, a, a few years as a fatty. And, so and, yeah. And, 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 you know, I spent a few years and, and, and when you get back on the crack and you start eating all the carbs, man, it's hard to, it's hard to stop, you know, uh, French fries with ketchup are delicious. Mm -hmm. You know, I love those things, but you start eating one and the next thing you know, it turns into a, a, a plate of French fries and then it turns into a big, you know, platter of nachos yeah. and, and, and you all, you know, it's, it's a huge drug. And there's a lot of money in a, in our society being sick and fat. For sure. For if sure. if 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 they really wanted to change healthcare in this country, they would change what what's provided for us for a diet, and they could eliminate eighty percent. I read a study years ago um, that said eighty percent of all hospitalizations are diet related. Yeah. yeah. Now, if you know that, why aren't we why aren't we focused on changing that? You know, they make us wear a seatbelt. Because mm -hmm. it's better for us, right? Yep. Why don't they make us change our diets because it's better for us? Oh, I know why. Because there's no money in that. Exactly. If you if you made grocery stores healthy, they would be a fraction of the size that they are. So real estate, right? There wouldn't be as much real estate money around it. People wouldn't go to you know the doctor as often. They wouldn't be getting for, treated for diabetes, heart disease, blah 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 blah. They would just go and enjoy their lives. Well, there's a lot. I mean, look at all the advertisements for all these drugs that are on TV. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of money in people being sick. There's a lot of fear in people being sick. And, you know, when you when you put those things together, you, ha you have a, a little uh, funky uh, thing going on with society. Yeah. And you wonder why are they, you know, why are they pushing? Oh, you should. Uh, listen, I understand people have issues. Sometimes they have medical conditions and they can't. They can't help it right and and you do need some medication to help you with those things or you need to make you know have a very um a very knowledgeable nutritionist help you tweak that for your health right but to have society push and push and push it's okay to be obese no it's not if you if you if your friend was over there trying to you know commit a slow suicide you would jump in and intervene mm -hmm. And when I see my friends do this or I see other people do this, I just want to help them and say, look, your life can be different. Oh, don't worry about me. I'm happy. You're happy now. But when you're laying in the hospital or you're on, you know, the you have diabetes or you have heart disease or you have, you know, you take these drugs that that like you said, the drugs causes you to take another drug, which causes you to take another drug, which affects you psychologically, physically, mentally it affects your relationships and everything else. And, and so, you know, anyway, no, I I, it's so it, yeah, we, we could talk about this forever because it's, it's an interesting subject and it's, you know, we don't need to minimize We don't not trying to minimize it. Like nobody needs medications. And of course, if you have a medical condition, you know, follow your doctor's advice, but you know that you can shift away as you get healthier. You there, there's countless examples of people being able to get off uh, blood pressure medicines and uh, heart medicines and all this but with a sound diet, nutrition, and exercise program. But we also, in our country, unfortunately, are subject to the quick fix mentality and just give me a pill and let me be on my way instead of investing in what it takes to to be healthy. But anyway, well, we'll stop that uh, right there. Because well, I mean, you're, okay, right, you're right there, but the problem is a lot of the doctors, they actually don't know anything more about the drugs true. than what the sales rep tells them. Oh, no, that's true. That's true. 
and that's really scary. And couple that with insurance being able to dictate what the doctors can or can't, how they can or can't practice. It's, you know, let's not, don't get me started. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you could go down this road exactly. for hours on end. But, but, you know, when you're an athlete or you're trying to, you know, you're looking at jujitsu and you're saying to yourself, hey, I really want to be good at this and I need to take care of myself, you know, and you, like, and you know this, but other people might not. Nutrition is a huge part of that. Mm -hmm. You know, you start eating, but, you know, we, I've seen it. I've got a guy right now, I have a guy that's lost over 90 pounds with us. I have another guy that's lost over 120 pounds with us. Nice. I have another guy that's lost 60 pounds with us. Um, awesome. You know, yeah, they're making these huge changes, and I work with them on their nutrition. I say, listen, if you if you listen to me between jujitsu and your and proper nutrition, I'll change every aspect of your life. That's really amazing, man. And and it works. You know, I've gotten so many people. You know, I do a lot of personal training with with private clients, and and you know, I've gotten people off uh, their blood pressure medication. I've got them off, you know, their um, their diabetes medication. I've got them. I've I've done it. I've been there. I've seen it. You know, you start. If you don't mind, I'll go down a little rabbit sure. hole for a second just so that guys understand this. But you start taking all these drugs for blood pressure and, and heart, and all of a sudden you have erectile dysfunction. Mm -hmm. And then now that's a problem psychologically for you because, you know, hey, we're men, right? right. And so, so that becomes a problem. And then you start having other aspects of your life fall apart because you're taking all these medicines because you won't change the root cause, which is your diet. And if you could change your diet, you could get off the medications. And next thing you know, you don't still have the same problem with erectile dysfunction and you can you can be happy again. Yeah. And not just saying being able to get an erection makes you happy, but it does. <laughs> you know? Depends it, it, on your age, I guess. <laughs> that's a big one, and there and there's no pun intended. There's so um, there's so many things from um, diabetes to uh, heart disease to um, Alzheimer's that that can certainly be greatly affected through nutrition. But we'll have to pick this up again at some point. But before we close, I want to ask you, you know, to get where you are and. To have accomplished what you've accomplished you know, doesn't happen easily or by yourself. So I'm sure there's a lot of people that have helped you become who you are and be where you are. So if you want to do any shout outs right now, um, certainly, certainly do that. I mean, I, you know, my list of shout outs would be astronomically long, you know, of course, I want to thank, you know, my buddy, Greg Thompson, uh, and, and, you know, he, he has a SOC P program that he does with the military, for, you know, having the first place that we could train at or, or having the first academy and, you know, Anderson Dickey for spending hours and hours and hours on the mat with me when I was brand new. You know, Tom Garner, he had the gym that made jiu-jitsu a priority. And it's probably one of the first places in yeah, – I'm sure it was the first place in North Carolina where a commercial facility said, hey, you know, these guys have priority over aerobics classes and kickboxing classes and everything else. I want these guys to get good. So, you know, Tom Garner was huge for that. And, uh, you know, I can't thank him enough for, for providing us a place to grow and develop. And then, you know, of course, Royce Gracie for all the time that he spent with me and everything he's done for myself and for everybody in the sport uh, and just the awareness of it. You know, the whole Gracie family for – you know, a lot of their marketing that they did to make the sport popular and to make things, make people know about jujitsu. You know, I've trained with everybody. Dave Camarillo is a, is a huge influence in my life. You know, Guillen, Hoffa Mendez, you know, I, I study their stuff a lot. I, I have a tremendous amount of respect for those guys. Hikaru Almeida spent so many, you know, months coming back and forth from New York to North Carolina to help a, a huge group of us here, in, you know, locally. Um, and it goes on and on, you know. And then I have my guys, you know, like Roy Marsh, that that's, you know, one of my students and, and has become, you know, one of my teachers as well. You know, uh, all the guys I came up with through Team Rock and, and, and over the years in the Hoist Gracie Network. I mean, it's just, it, you know what I mean? Like, I thank everybody for every minute that they spent on the mat, you know, tolerating me, uh, helping me, you know, encouraging me. And, uh, it, you know, there's, I mean, I, and my wife is probably the one that I probably should thank the most because she allows me to spend an exorbitant amount of time doing what I love to do. And, you know, time away from her and traveling and helping people. You know, it's been an amazing ride so far. I mean, I never would have thought that I would be where I am in a sport that I, you know, doing what I love on a daily basis and changing people's lives. Uh, it, that's just, you know, that's the paycheck that's beyond, you know, value is what you do for other people's lives. And that's why. You know, that's why I continue to do what I'm doing. I mean, there's been, you know, after all these surgeries, many, many times you just want to throw up your hands and say, you know what, man, it's too much for me. I'm out. 
and then somebody comes to you and tells you what a difference you've made in their life or, you know, how jujitsu is really helping them off the mats or deal with situations at work and, and how they've got a calmness now because they've got their, you know, frustrations out in jujitsu and they're not taking out on their workmates anymore. Then all of a sudden you say, man, I'm, I'm, I'm in this till this guy gets a black belt. And then, you know, by the time he's ready for his black belt, you've got 10 guys behind him that you've got the same feelings for. So I guess I'm stuck with this forever. That's great. You know, <laughs> isn't it interesting how sometimes it's a really big overt impact and sometimes it's just the tiny pebble in the pond and, it, and the ripples go out. And if you can see how it affects so many people's lives in different ways on and off the mat. So it's a beautiful thing. And you certainly had a great adventure so far in jiu-jitsu and a great journey. So I appreciate you sharing a little bit more about your life with us. I know people really get inspired by hearing it and or will be getting inspired by hearing it. And you've impacted a lot of lives, man. So just keep doing your doing your thing and then keep going forward, brother. Thanks, man. Thanks for, for everybody having something to do with me and, you know, reaching out to me and to get advice or to get information. I love it. I help everybody. You know, I open my doors all the time for people and, and I give them everything I can and they can go back to their own academy and, and do whatever they want to do with it. You know, I don't hide anything. I don't care where you come from. Awesome. All right. Well, thanks so much, man, for sharing your knowledge and long, healthy, happy life. You too, buddy. Thank you. All right. Really enjoyed that conversation with Jason. Up now is the Make a Difference, Make an Impact segment. As Carl von Clausewitz said, pursue one great decisive aim with force and determination. Whatever it is that you're going to do in your life, if you have any interest in doing something extraordinary, if you have any interest in performing better than other people, if you have any interest in doing something that will be remembered, this is the takeaway for you. Pick one thing and do it with force and determination. The only way that you're going to be able to push past the mountain of obstacles that is going to try to stop you is to have maniacal focus, to know exactly what you want, to have clarity of purpose, to have a crystal clear vision in your mind of what you're trying to accomplish, something that you could tell anybody in a single sentence. When you have that and you stare at it all day and you think about exactly how you're going to make it happen and you tie your identity to it, then you've got a chance. Because then, my friends, when that obstacle comes before you, you will muster the force that you need to destroy that obstacle. And as Jocko Willing said, most of us aren't defeated in one decisive battle. We're defeated one tiny, seemingly insignificant surrender at a time that chips away at who we should really be. That's how we lose. It's in those little moments, the quiet moments, where nobody's looking, where it it seems like it just doesn't matter. And so we take the easy path. We take the surrender. We don't worry about pushing back. We don't muster the force that that obstacle demands because it's hard. It's challenging. It's fear-inducing. It may spike your anxiety. But as you sit there and think about that moment in isolation, you fail to see the grander picture of what happens when one person is whittled away one chip at a time. It's called the death of a thousand cuts. Any one of them by themselves is nothing, but when you take them as a holistic thing, suddenly you cease to be the person that you could be if you were willing to muster the force and determination to see yourself through to the end of what it is that you set out to accomplish. It is not going to be easy. In fact, it is going to be incredibly hard. It will challenge everything about who you are. But if you can do it, at the end of that journey, you will be a fundamentally different person. In fact, that is the point, my friends, of going on a journey. The journey is never the point. The point is always, the point is always self-transformation. But if you want to transform the self in those moments where it's called for, you must muster force 
and determination. And that's going to do it for this edition of the show. As always, I thank you for listening. Hope you're enjoying the show. If you feel like you're benefiting from the show and want to show your support, you can support us on our Patreon page and a link in the show notes. Please like and follow us on social media and help us spread the word by reposting our posts and telling others about the show. You can leave comments on the website at www.racyjujitsurocks.com. You can also go to iTunes and leave comments as well as rate the show. And we would appreciate a five-star rating, which helps us with our standing in iTunes. You can also leave comments on our YouTube channel. If you have suggestions for the show, please don't hesitate to give those. We always like feedback and suggestions. Okay, that's going to do it. So until next time, this is Marty Josie, and I'll see you on the mat.